Okay, welcome everyone to the 11th Craftsbury webinar of the 2020 COVID season. Um, this afternoon, we're going to talk about the ERG. We have uh, four of us, myself, Kevin McDermott, our associate director, uh, Lisa Schlinker, an ERG legend herself, first lightweight woman to break seven minutes. And I was, uh, I, I did not know this until we got on for the <laughs> rehearsal, but uh, Sarah Gronwald is also a Crash B champion in UK. If you look closely when she makes her presentation, you can see her hammer on the wall behind her. Um, <laughs> Please, please stay muted throughout uh, with over 100 people in the, in the meeting. There's bound to be some background noise in some of your households. So if, if you have questions, please submit those to Erica privately in the chat and she will vet those and uh, pitch them to us after our presentation is over. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, next week's webinar, the 12th in the series, will feature Erica Sloan, our fleet manager, who has been ably managing these webinars, uh, both behind the scenes and during the webinar itself throughout the series. And she's going to present um, on Rowing in the Ancient World. Uh, Erica is a self-described classics geek and... Um, her presentation, she told me today, will will come culminate in her exegesis of uh, of the first depiction in literature of a recreational rowing race um, happened in the Aeneid. So, uh, for that that will be next week. <laughs> so, without without uh, I always say without further rambling, um, and I'm not sure I pronounced exegesis correctly. In any event, I prefer the term nerd to geek. Okay, then. Uh, <laughs> Erica is a nerd, not a geek. Um, all right. Without further ado, uh, we're going to start, and um, Kevin is going to be first to present today. He's got a, a slideshow entitled Dr. Erg Love, and I don't want to steal any of his thunder, so Kevin, over to you. Thank you very much, Troy. Um, it's a real honor to be presenting today, and uh, along with Sarah and Lisa and Troy, um, you know, we've had a lot of time together at Craftsbury and I'm really honored to have this time virtually with all of my really esteemed and beloved colleagues here. So um, I'm going to kick things off because my presentation will aim to be um, kind of a general address to people's concerns, problems, hangups, issues, and stresses with the ergometer. Um, when Troy initially uh, put forward this topic as a potential webinar um, uh, episode or webisode or whatever, um, he said, I'd like it to kind of mirror some of the presentations that we do during camp, particularly on the Tuesday and Wednesday of our camp schedule, where a coach will present on the ERG. During those sessions when I've been running them on site, the most common occurrence is for that session to turn into somewhat of a therapy session for people on their challenges in using the ergometer effectively. Um, I hope in my PowerPoint presentation that I'm able to articulate the journey that I've been on from somebody who is actually kind of ambivalent about the erg. I saw it as a pretty utilitarian training device and, I don't know, never had a strong feeling one way or the other, to someone who, in my 40s now, love the ERG, legitimately, without exaggeration, without hyperbole, like, really do um, love the time that I spend on the ERG. So, without further ado, I hope my PowerPoint will help kind of share my rationale for some of that. So, um, I have a, a PowerPoint presentation. I will narrate it for those of you who are not on the screen, are not, are not able to look at the screen for the Zoom. So those who are able to see, um, forgive me for kind of explaining what you're looking at. But for those who don't have video, I'll try to narrate what we're seeing. The first slide is a really professional Photoshop job from me uh, of the great Peter Sellers uh, portraying Dr. Strangelove 
and I have very artistically crossed out the strange and written Dr. Erglove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Erg. So that is our theme for the day. Um, the Erg has such a bad rep and has become so, I don't know, almost like a, a, an easy target for people to punch down and kind of incriminate for its, uh, the, the challenges that they have, that it's become a meme. So this first slide is a, a, an erg meme that I found that frankly, I don't really appreciate that much. But it says, I love to erg, it's a quote, I love to erg, said no one ever. Very humorous uh, to those who do not like to erg. The second one in our memification of the erg and the really unfair vilification of the erg, there's a picture of the rowing machine and it's modeled after the popular 80s inspirational and motivational poster series that were popular in offices. It says the rowing machine, the few minutes in your day where you suddenly regret life. Again, I don't appreciate these sort of memes that really vilify the herb. I, I am a true lover and want to celebrate the herb. So I've tried my hand at creating an herb meme. It's my first one, so please judge on that on that sliding scale. Um, it's just a picture of an erg, and it says, erging is beautiful. Um, that is, again, sincerely and without hyperbole, how I feel. Why do I feel that way? Um, I think I've changed my, been able to successfully change my approach to engaging with the earth. Um, the first category of how I've changed my approach to engaging with the earth falls under this heading of attitude determines outcome. Um, I, I presented this little adage in my first webinar, which was the second week of our webinar series. But if I approach the ERG with a negative mindset, my experience is going to be poor. Um, if I approach it thinking and determined for it to be a miserable experience, I guarantee that it will be a miserable experience. So I really try to actively prime myself for a positive experience on the ERG. It is positive visualization, positive self-talk, positive associations with the ERG. Um, and I spend a couple moments during the days that I am going to get on the erg as a, my primary exercise, really just repeating a mantra or a, an, an adage of, you know, the erg is positive. It is going to be a good experience and I'm going to have a great opportunity to train and learn on this uh, machine. So one of the elements that I love, especially now, is the efficiency of the ERG um, for, you know, and I won't limit it to just adults, but, you know, primarily our audience here are a lot of adult scholars, masters level scholars. Um, the efficiency of, you know, how we use our time is critically important in our lives. With the ERG, I can get an exceedingly, ex impressively efficient workout in um, a relatively short time. Um, and I, I really love that. I like thinking 30 minutes on this machine, 20 minutes on this machine, even 15 minutes or a Tabata in six minutes, I can get a really great stimulus and um, go on with my day having gotten a really great workout. So the efficiency I love. Um, secondly, I love the objectivity of it. This is an area where I think some people shy away from or feel a little bit um, negative about the objectivity of the ERG, but I really enjoy the quantification of my output. So when I am on there, regardless of the type of workout, the ERG provides me with a quantification of my effort. I enjoy doing baseline or just uh, in, let's call them initial exercises, recording, and I, I record fairly obsessively, um, recording my data and then charting my progress over time while setting goals. Um, you know, for those of you who do not keep record books, I would encourage you to do so. Um, having 
kind of the, the quantified objective data that you can refer to and reflect upon, I think is a, a really positive attribute of the ERG. Um, the second category here um, kind of falls under the ways other than just a workout that you can use the ERG. So I have a stock photo here of someone, I'm not sure if uh, this athlete is sitting at half slide on the recovery or half slide on the drive, but they sure are having fun at half slide, aren't they? Um, so the, the heading for this next short section is that the ERG allows you to focus on technique to apply both indoors and on the water. Erging is an approximation of your experience on the water and the biomechanics of your experience, whether it's in a sweet boat or a skull. It is a kind of, it is an abstract approximation of the motions that you will make from a kinesiology standpoint on the water. But it can be used to first have a really efficient, safe and effective workout indoors and can translate to your time on the water if, you know, if we approach the ERG with thoughtfulness and care. This first point, to erg with a mirror or to use video. Um, I have a mirror set up in my home space that I erg when I'm at the boathouse or in our tank, I have a mirror. The visual feedback from the erg is very valuable. Um, it is something that you miss on the water. Real time, immediate and continuous feedback of how you are moving. Uh, and, and the biomechanics of your motion on the ERG. It can be a great training tool. Um, it can also be very motivating. I, you know, do enjoy like seeing a technical change that I'm attempting to make manifest in the mirror, in the direct real-time visual feedback. You can also use your phone if you don't have access to a mirror. Set your phone up, start a video, and then you can play back and analyze your erging and really use it to make some substantive changes to how you're moving. Secondly, on the erg, you can adapt many, many drills that you may be familiar with, with on the water rowing. Um, Troy, um, uh, Carol Bauer, um, and a, a Helen Tillman, a couple of our other coaches did a wonderful webinar on a, a, a kind of full menu of drill options. Most of those drills that they detailed during their webinar for sculling can be executed on an herb. So whether it's the release pick drill or the catch end pick drill, a pause drill, any segment stroke of the, um, of the, of the stroke, um, sorry, any segmented portion of the stroke, excuse me, a pause drill. You can adapt all of those to the ERG, and I think it breaks up your experience and makes it a much more engaging and productive time on the ERG. Finally, um, I'll just very briefly talk about changing the damper setting, because Lisa will talk about this a lot more in depth, but I encourage people to use the entire range of the damper setting available on the, you know, whichever um, erg you are using. You can change the drag factor and the resistance level. So we do this for a number of reasons, but one is the resistance that you feel on the water, for example, in a 10 mile per hour headwind. Think about that for just a moment, like you're sculling along and all of a sudden you are in a 10 mile per hour head you can approximate the, that sensation, that feeling of, of, of external drag loading on the erg. Um, imagine just the opposite. You're sculling along in a screaming tailwind, eight to 12 mile per hour tailwind, just screaming right at your nose. Um, you can approximate that by lowering the damper and, and lowering the drag factor on the erg. And I um, think that you have a very different experience when you do that, which is engaging and productive. Um, again, Lisa will talk a little bit more about this um, later on. Finally, um, I just want to talk about the monitor for a little bit because I, 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 I want to encourage you to explore the monitor 
and to use all of the different options that the monitor presents, whatever ERG you're using. Um, the functionality of an RP3 versus a, um, a C2 monitor, um, there's a, a wide a range, a wide array, excuse me, of ways that you can use the monitor. This, these people seem to be enamored with their monitor, uh, for those of you who can see this lovely stock photo of people erging. Um, so ultimately, I, I want you and encourage you to think of the monitor as your friend. The monitor is not your enemy. And I've worked with a lot of athletes, both at the collegiate level and at Craftsbury and at the master's level, who have a very negative relationship with the monitor. Um, some ways that you can have a more positive engagement with the monitor and with the machine in general, use all three pace displays that are available on the C2 monitor or um, the Ortec monitor or the RP3 monitor. They all have a variety of options to display the calculated pace or output of your effort. Um, on the Concept2, for example, you can use watts, which is a calculation of the force you apply to the handle during the drive. Um, the pace is a calculation of the force and speed vectors of both the recovery and the drive. So you get a different perspective of how your output is calculated on the monitor. Use them all. A lot of people have a very strong psychological association with the 500 meter pace number. It is so loaded for them that simply by using a different, um, a different monitor setting, they can really break some of those walls and can change their association with the monitor. Second, I think everybody can find a workout on the ERG that they really enjoy. Um, this even applies to some of our most uh, kind of, the, the, those people at Craftsbury who come and find the most challenge in getting on an ERG. For me, I love 1500 meter pieces. The length for me is ideal. It is long enough that you really have to think about how you manage it, but it's short enough that you can really burn and attack. Um, I, I love doing 1500 meter pieces. So you may think that's, those sound awful to me. I don't like doing those, but there will be something that you can find, whether it's a short interval workout, whether it's a long steady state workout or anything in between, you know, really strive to find a workout that you feel comfortable and you feel confident executing on the, on the machine. And then find my final point, and I'll uh, hand it off, is to get off the arrogant move. I think oftentimes people will um, complain of soreness, stiffness, pains, aches that can be alleviated by setting a short rest interval into your workout, getting off the erg and doing some squats or doing some lunges or doing a push up or you know five push ups um, and opening up your hips, opening up your joints, changing the way that your lower back is moving. Um, simply by having those rest intervals programmed in, um, some of the um, private clients that I, I coach and work with here, they, they've suddenly liked the ERG because after eight minutes, they can get up and take a 30 minute, br a 30 second break and really alleviate some of the aches and pains or discomforts that they may be feeling. Um, so I went through that. Don't don't ever forget that it could be worse. Um, you could be rowing and training on a spring action rowing exerciser or the 80s inspired rowing action exerciser, both of which we make people at Craftsbury use if they misbehave egregiously. So anyway, hopefully that's a, a effective or at least somewhat well-received pep talk for engaging with the ERG in a more positive way. So I'll hand it back to uh, Troy and thank everyone again for joining us today. Okay, um, Kevin, all I'm seeing is your screen and it's disconcerting to me, I'm sorry. Uh, there you go. Um, 
And uh, I'm just going to pass it over to Sarah. Sarah is next. Take it away. Great. Hi. Thanks. Um, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, conquering the ERG. Um, kind of the mind game that people tend to get into sometimes with the ERG, which Kevin alluded to also. But um, sometimes people can just totally psych themselves out. And it is intimidating. There are very few things in our lives which give us such direct, honest feedback. Um, and sometimes that's not fun to receive. So on the ERG, you're gonna get feedback whether you like it or not. And it helps a lot to find ways to use that feedback to your advantage. So um, my next slide is winter. So winter is coming like they say in Game of Thrones. Those of you who live in a, in a place that has a winter are starting to think about spending a lot of time indoors and a lot of time on the ERG. And uh, that doesn't have to fill us with dread. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can have fun on the ERG. Um, but you know, it helps to go into it knowing like I'm probably gonna spend a lot of time on this thing and I wanna make that time as useful as I can. So we're gonna be doing a lot of this. This is not a technical discussion about her. <laughs> this is just a picture of someone erging. I'm not about to break it down. Um, so some of the things that I think about when I'm erging, and I tend to do a lot of steady state on the erg um, in the winter. I'll maybe once a week or once every couple weeks do some difficult pieces on the erg, like the 1500s or 500s. But I tend to do a lot of 10K or an hour of just steady state. And I have to kind of play a lot of games with myself to not just get completely bored. Um, so one of the ways that I think about building mental toughness on the ERG also helps avoid boredom. And that is, say you're doing a 10K steady state piece or even a 10K piece as fast as you can. Um, every time I get to about a thousand kilometers, I try to keep my stroke rate exactly the same and decrease my splits by two to four seconds for 20 strokes. Um, and then I know that I'm gonna get a little break after that. It's gonna feel like a little break even though my stroke rate will be the same. I can let my splits go back to my goal average split, but I'm having some intensity for those 20 strokes. And it really helps me break it up just by thousand that way. Um, when I was coaching a master's club here in Michigan, a lot of times as a group, they would sort of self-organize. And as they were coming into the last minute or 10 seconds or hundred meters of a piece, they would all decide together to like lift the stroke rate and do a little sprint for fun as a way of ending on a fun note. And I liked that, but I would, I recommended that you actually take the stroke rate down for that last hundred meters or 30 seconds or whatever you're doing and keep the intensity and keep the power per stroke because when you're doing an ERG test or when you're racing or wanting to have a really good score or whatever you're doing on the ERG, having a lot of power per stroke is really important. It's kind of the one thing that's not gonna fail you. If you, if you, <laughs> your technique might not stay on, you're gonna do the best you can, but if you've got good power per stroke because you've trained yourself to have good power per stroke, it'll be there when you need it. And the best way to work on power per stroke is to not lift your stroke rate. It's to increase your power without lifting your stroke rate. And when you are looking at the monitor and that inevitable feedback that you get from the ERG, you can really see what a difference you can make just by increasing your intensity, maybe firing your muscles a little differently. I know that Lisa's gonna talk a little bit about how to, man how to manage power per stroke in her talk. So we won't go too much into that, but. I really like playing around with power per stroke when I'm doing an ERG test or piece or steady state or whatever. So I'm using the concept two monitor for my photos just because that's what I have. Um, you can look at the 500 meter split number. And I think most of you might know what that is, but it just means the number here, whether it says three minutes or two minutes or one minute, 40 seconds, that's how long it's gonna take you to row 500 meters at this pace. So that is what this screen looks like. And then if you click on this change units button, you'll see a screen that tells you what your average calorie per hour is, how many calories you've burned, your strokes per minute and your elapsed time. Strokes per minute and elapsed time are gonna show up in every single screen view. And this one is the one I'm gonna spend some time talking about, watts. So this is your average watt here 
And this is just this stroke, how many watts you generated on that stroke during this workout that you're doing on the ERG. So when you, when you look at the 500 meter split, that number that whether it says two minutes or 150, there are a lot of different possible watts that might actually contribute to that number. So in this chart here, I've got a split here on the left-hand side and the corresponding watts that go with that split. So you could be holding a 135, whoops, I need to go back for a second. You could be holding a 135 split, but your watts might be anywhere from 398 up to 408. So when you're doing an ERG workout, you don't actually see the decimal point next to the split number. So you'll see a 135, you'll see 150, 210, whatever, but it won't be 210.7 or 210.1. So there's a lot of leeway in there. And if you look at this watt chart here, you can see that if you focus on your watts while you're erging, you're getting a much more fine-tuned feedback on how much power you're generating. So I like to look at watts because of that, number one. I know that I'm looking at a much more direct number, but it also isn't exactly the split. And there isn't that same kind of mystique around like, oh no, it's not you know, my goal split. It's just a watt it doesn't matter. There's a little bit of leeway there. But moving on to the next slide here, when you're man, well, gosh, I keep going forward, sorry. When you're managing your workout, many of you might subscribe to like a training plan or something that has you doing erg workouts in various ranges. So it might have you doing a steady state range, an anaerobic threshold range, um, max power range. And it's difficult sometimes without the technology or access to sports science to, to know exactly what is your 100% heart rate, what is your anaerobic threshold heart rate. And so I find it really helps to use watts to indicate what that number is. So this is just from my team from several years ago. They did a 2000 meter erg test. They have their overall time here in this column and their average split time here and their average watt. And so I just used that average watt number as 100%, even though it's not like if you were going to do a watt test, it's only three or four strokes long and it's a much higher number. But this for the purposes of training is their 100% watt. And so then for all of our workouts that we do over the course of the winter, we're just using this chart to determine what watt should we hold for each workout. So if it's steady state, we want to be, say if you're, 2K is a 721 and your average split is a 150. That means your average watt 100% is 260. Steady state should be 195 watts or less. AT should be 221 watts. It just makes it kind of easier to know where you should be on the ERG. And mentally, what I found with this team was that we did a workout that was like a three by 2K workout using watts and they were supposed to hold their watts at 85%. And a couple of people actually got a PR on two out of the three 2Ks because they didn't realize how hard they were going. Because they were looking at watts, it didn't necessarily mean as much to them. It wasn't intimidating to them in the same way that a, that a 500 meter split is. And they performed much better. So that is one way that you can sort of trick yourself or trick the erg more like yourself, but trick yourself into performing better because you're just not getting hung up on the numbers. So I hope this makes sense. Um, and uh, that's, those are the two things that I wanted to talk about. Lower your stroke rate, increase your power, and focus on something other than your 500 meter split sometimes. And you might find that the results are, are favorable. And then you will be feeling strong and powerful as you move out of the ergon back onto the water next spring. So that's it. Thanks, Troy. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Um, back out of your screen, and I will uh, share my screen. And um, I'm next, so here we go. That's eh, not what I want to show you. Okay. Um, I was at a coaching conference when the the U.S. Rowing Convention was in Oklahoma City a few years ago. And there was a uh, sort of coaches round table discussion, one of those 
sort of big affairs with a couple of hundred people in a in a big convention hall, and uh, various various coaches from various countries, mostly mostly in North America, were just discussing the force curve and what it ought to look like. And I, I, as I remember this story, and I may be wrong, but I think it was Chris Korzanowski who stood up and finally said, everybody wants to argue endlessly about what the ideal force curve looks like and nobody knows. You know what I do? I take a copy of the force curves of my best drawers and I show them to my worst drawers and I say, here, do this. So I wanted to talk today about the, that feature of the monitor, I think uh, concept two, I believe that was an innovation that came in with the PM3, but it might be the PM4. Maybe, maybe one of the other panelists can correct me and, and let us know. But uh, if, if you've never played with the force curve and, and tried to sort of shape your curve or find out what your, what your uh, force curve on the drive looks like, that is a very worthwhile screen to, to play around with. Um, and I should go, I should play this instead of just, there we go. Um, what we have here is a, a, just a very nice smooth curve that was produced just at firm paddle pressure. And the initial, uh, opening gambit about nobody knows what the ideal force curve looks like. Uh, one thing that I think that almost everyone who, who knows very much about rowing and sculling and erging will agree on is that the curve ought to be a nice smooth curve. It ought to be somewhat symmetrical and it ought not to have uh, peaks and valleys and lumps and, and sharp edges. So, it's, it's well worth being able to get on the erg and just go through your drive sequence and produce this kind of a nice, shallow, symmetrical curve. Um, and that's, that's where we're going to start. And, oh, shoot. Okay. Um, this, is a, this is a curve that I, I would say is, is representative of what I call and called in my uh, webinar on rhythm and, and free speed, the hit it and quit it. Um, this kind of curve in which the peak is, is sort of off to the left and the right hand side sort of tails off in a shallow way as it does here. I, I, I would like to have gotten the peak even earlier, but uh, the erg, erg model that, that I used was, was not able to produce that curve. But in any event, this if if you have if it if it peaks very early to the left and then tails off shallowly as this does, that's pretty indicative that you're you're being too passive in the second half of your drive. Um, you're you're hitting it and quitting it. So this is a curve that you probably don't want to see and would like to to do something to mitigate. And so here's the bookend to that. Um, this is a backloaded drive, meaning that the person on the erg producing this curve was being a little passive with the early stages of the drive phase and was then being more assertive and more dynamic in the second half of the drive. And so the, the curve peaks fairly far to the right. And I hadn't seen this curve uh, until about uh, 2005. I was, I was coaching my, my high school crews at the Episcopal School of Dallas at the time. And I had a, a tall, rangy kid who, he, 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 wasn't, he wasn't a firecracker. He was kind of a slow moving dude. And he was, he was uh, tall and long limbed. And for whatever reason, the rhythm that he developed um, in, in his learning to skull was one that produced this kind of curve. And when I saw him on the erg and had had the monitor set to the to the force curve window, I I had to wonder, okay, how do, how does he produce that, and could I duplicate it? And so I, I set about to to sit down and try to figure out based on what I saw him doing and what I saw the curve looked like, tried to reproduce that curve and to to get my nervous system to to fire in such a way that I would drive in in a way that would produce this curve. 
And it, it was difficult at first. I, I, I couldn't quite get it because it was not my neurological habit. But I, I think it was a valuable exercise and eventually I did get it. And so if, if I wanna produce that curve, I can sit on the erg and do that. And I, I think it's well worth sort of examining the curves of the people that you row with and seeing if you can reproduce their curve just for the sake of, of feeling something different about the way that you apply force over the course of the drive. Um, I had another uh, student who rode for me at the Episcopal School of Dallas and I, uh, I was going to, I, I could not reproduce his curve because I, no, no BS, this kid's curve looked like the Matterhorn. It went straight up to a sharp peak and came straight down. And I, I watched him erg that way. I encouraged him to smooth out his power application on the drive uh, with limited success. And, and uh, it's, yeah, you, you don't want a Matterhorn. Um, and I'm sorry I couldn't reproduce one. I, I just couldn't get myself to, to make that motion. Um, this is not a curve. This is, uh, this, this is the result of sort of tugging twice. Um, if, if we agree that the curve, what, whatever, whatever the optimal curve is, whether it's a perfect parabola or a parabola that peaks a little bit to the left of center or uh, a parabola with a little bit of a flat topped mesa, um, whatever it is, it's still curvilinear. Um, and this, is, is a lumpy mess. If this is what your curve looks like, you need to sit down and do some work on smoothly accelerating the handle. And even if you, even if you have to back off and do this on the paddle in order to convince your, your brain to, to get your, your neurological response to be smoother, that is a, that is a worthwhile exercise. Um, this is also not a curve. I, I, I don't remember exactly what it looked like for the for the person on the erg to create this curve, but but there you go. Um, this is this is where I'm going to end, and this is uh, this is sort of a variant on the first slide that I showed with just the nice symmetrical curve. This is an attempt to take the same stroke with greater intensity, greater uh, greater power per stroke, higher stroke rate. And so the curve peaks higher um, and it's, it's a little bit pixelated, which is just sort of the nature of the, the concept to monitor. Um, you can, you can get software that will, that will measure your force curve a little more accurately and make a more smooth curve out of it. But for, for the most part, this, uh, this feature of the concept to monitor is, is really very, very helpful. So um, that's where I'm going to end it. And uh, I, I think uh, the, the overarching message of, of my 10 minutes or whatever this has been is that every, every experience of the ERG does not have to be a data-driven moment of truth. And I think that, uh, you know, Kevin um, made some references to that and uh, so did Sarah. And uh, so we'll, um, We'll see what Lisa's got in store for us. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and, or actually, no, I need to keep sharing my screen because Lisa's slides are on my computer. So um, actually, I will stop sharing it just for a minute so everybody can see Lisa begin this thing. Lisa, over to you and just tell me when you want me to bring the slides up. Kevin, thank you. Sarah, thank you. Troy, thank you. That was awesome. That was awesome. So that leads me into where I'm going to go, which is a little bit different avenue but I'm gonna take all the things that you guys said and hopefully wrap them in, into one. And if I don't, so what I'm gonna ask from you, my fellow panelists, is to interject where I leave off or where there's a void, okay? So I want you guys to just chime in wherever it is, all right? All right, so here's, um, I learned something back in my early days of rowing with the national team. I had Mr. Jim Dietz come down to um, the, uh, the rowing center. And he says, Lisa, oh my gosh, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know how you can even move a single. Because all I was doing was just, I'd rush forward and I'd pound into it and I'd go slow. I'd rush forward and I'd pound into my catch and I wouldn't go anywhere. 
So what he had me do, what he had me train, he says, okay, I'm going to put, we're going to practice this on the earth. And I want you to visualize and to start to feel, to start to adapt, to start to have your body be a little bit more supple to what you're actually doing. So on an erg as opposed to being from, uh, I don't know, 110 to 120, he stuck me all the way down the fan set, the drag setting, or the fan setting, I should say, down to zero. He says, okay, I really want you to hold. So if you can hold an X amount of split at a three, give me the same thing when the fan setting is all the way down. What do you have to do different? Of course, the first few times I could not do it. There's no way I could do it um, because I was still back into my old pounding of a single, a pen in the foot stretcher, and going nowhere. Once I tried it more and more, I actually found out that, yeah, the dynamic of how I have to push, the impulse that I have to have, the relaxation I have to have, the suppleness of my body that I need to have to hold that exact same split, with the fan setting all the way down. And then of course, Jim, Jim was kind of mean to me, but he wanted me to progress. So I thank him for that. He's a wonderful gentleman. He put a towel over the top of the fan. So he covered up the fan. So there's no, you know, so now you have very, very little resistance. He said, okay, do the same. Again, it took me a few days. So before I go on, before I talk more, I'm gonna have Troy, one, describe what the difference was that you felt. Uh, and I think we have a video, Erica. We do. And uh, correct? Yeah. All right, so let's see which one has. Okay, so Lisa basically uh, expressed a great deal of faith in my ability to, to be a quick study of this same phenomenon and asked me to, to get on the ERG and, and reproduce her experience with Jim Dietz to the best of my abilities. And so I've, I've got three video clips. And in the first one, uh, I'm rowing at a, at a damper setting of about four, maybe a little more than four, which produced a drag factor of uh, 115. And I'm, I'm trying to hold a 20, 20 strokes a minute, and just about 80%, just trying to, to create a, a nice drive rhythm at 20 strokes a minute at a drag factor of 115 and see what kind of watts that produced. So that was step one. Step two was, as Lisa said, to take the damper all the way down to zero or one or whatever the lowest setting is, which on the machine I was using produced a drag factor of 75. And uh, I, I was fairly successful at keeping the same stroke rate and producing the same watts at that 75 resistance as I had been at 115. And uh, Lisa was passing along Jim Dietz's cruelty to me and said, okay, do the third one with the towel over the vent. And I, I want you to stay at 20 strokes a minute and produce the same watts that you produced at 115 and 75. And uh, the first day that I tried that, I, I was a miserable failure on the third step. The first, the second step went just fine. I was able to produce the same watts at the same stroke rate with a, with a uh, slightly different um, approach uh, in terms of the way that my body moved. And uh, when, I, when I put the towel over the, over the uh, um, flywheel, uh, it was hopeless. I, I lost maybe 50, 60 watts. And so Lisa encouraged me to try it again the next day. So I tried it again the next day and had a little more success. So we'll, we'll show you those three video clips. And, uh, you know, Lisa asked me, you know, what, what, what was the subjective experience? What was the difference? What did you have to do in order to um, produce the same watts at the same stroke rate with much less resistance? And, you know, I think first, first and foremost, she, she, she used the word supple. And there is a, there's an element of relaxation that if, if, you, if you can't relax into the new rhythm, you're not gonna get the same watts out of it. Um, and then there's also, there's a quickness that has to go with it. With, with less resistance, um, 
things have to move more quickly so that you can accelerate the handle and produce the same watts with less resistance. Um, and uh, so I'll, I'll, let's, let's share the screen and we'll go through these clips and um, I'll let Lisa take it back again. So this one is the clip of uh, drag factor 115, 20 strokes a minute. And my lovely wife, Kimberly, took these videos. So here we go. So about, about 255 watts at, uh, at a stroke rate of 20 to 21. And see if you can see the difference between the 115 and the 75. Okay, and then uh, the, the extreme version, which uh, I, I wasn't entirely successful at keeping the same watts. Um, I, I found and I complained to Lisa that there's, there's so much slack after the catch when you, when you put the shirt over the vent and, um, and reduce the, the um, drag factor. This, this, this produced a drag factor of about 33. So here's that version. So clearly there, there was so little resistance that I had a little bit of difficulty um, keeping the stroke rate down and keeping the watts up. Uh, that, was, that was far more successful than my first attempt and um, I'm, gonna keep, I'm gonna keep at it until I get it. But uh, Lisa, back over to you. Tell me if you want me to play any of these clips again. No, I, I'm good. Uh, awesome, thank you, Troy, so much. I really appreciate that. So the reason why I asked Troy to do that is Again, um, if any of your coaches have ever said, on, and I'm speaking on the water, on the water, um, if you're a hammer, if your blades go in too fast, or sorry, no, that's not a problem. If, you, if your legs go down too fast, if you don't have that full connection or fluidity with your body, this might be a drill for you that you could do on land that will apply to on the water. So here's how I relate it. Here's how I took how I took it, or how it applied to me, and how uh, Coach Jim told me. Once my blade goes into the water, I have to be I have to trust that it's locked in. I have to trust so that time that timing process. So for for example, on the herb, we have that full compression, and we change so that the the change a little bit slack, and then we have to actually connect. Have our shoulder blades come down our lats engaged, our core is in the right position, and our legs are loaded up so that we can change that direction. And at some point in time, when it's in a tailwind, as Kevin said, when it's in a tailwind, you're not gonna be able to feel that too much. It's gonna be, the boat's gonna be moving really fast. So if you have very limited slack on the rowing machine, you just have to trust and teach your body to do these motions. If you teach your bodies to do these motions, if you find the splits, whether it's watts, calories, you know, whatever you want to choose, whatever you want to choose, whatever number works for you, if you do those things, any of the resistance low, I guarantee you that your impulse, not hard, not fast, but supple and mindful, when you take the stroke in a single, will be much more, uh, it will be much more developed. Meaning you come in, catch lights, 
and then you press off and you find that impulse there. I'm hoping, I'm hoping, and I think uh, most of the coaches will agree here, maybe not, that the skill set that we apply to the rowing machine, we can apply to rowing. Is that correct, coaches? Yep. Hopefully. I assent to that. Sure. Yep. Okay. So, so what I want people to do if they're feeling challenged, um, again, this is Troy. I had I I tossed Troy underneath the bus and I said, Troy, you got to be my guinea pig. He's never done it before. Now, mind you, it took me three three months to get this nailed down, <laughs> and I just gave Tro Troy a day or two. But if you can feel, figure out how to do that pickup, how that handle can come to you, how your body can work with you, how your speed of your legs change. Um, maybe, maybe you don't put it, the fan setting all the way down. Maybe you're at a five, maybe you go down to a two. And then just testing that out just a little bit. If you don't like it, don't do it. But I guarantee you, well, I can only guarantee you from my perspective, I can guarantee you that my leg drive, my leg drive after I had learned how to do that, whether I was in a single, a double, a quad, uh, I don't row sweet boats only for recreation. Uh, <laughs> and that's an ugly thing. Uh, but for scaling boats, I was much better connected through the entire stroke. I did not miss that top quarter because I had to find how my shoulder was feeling. Was I down relaxed? Did I grab? If I grab, then I'm going to miss it. Then you're not going to hit the splits. But if you just the full compression, Take, the, take that catch, get ready to go, go into that body posture that you know all know, that strong body posture, and start to exhale, everything will work together. So give that a shot. Um, so do it on watts, do it on splits, do it on whatever, but try it every now and then, and I guarantee you it'll work, it'll transfer over to the water. At least it did for me. Troy, back to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Uh, I, it, it was definitely a valuable experiment, experiment for me and um, the whole headwind tailwind idea uh, corresponding to different drag factors. Uh, that's valuable information for everybody. So uh, Erica, what do we have in the way of uh, questions for the panel? Okay. So I have gotten a few that have come in. Um, the, now is the time, guys, if you have questions about erging or about anything that's been covered, you can send them to me. Please send them privately via the chat so they don't distract everybody else. Um, and I think I'll actually start with a question that I got via email before the talk, um, which I think I sent out to you guys. Um, but it was someone who was asking for any of your thoughts on um, options like the other than the C2 for a home training unit or C2 included for a home training unit um, and asking if you know of any programs uh, with home rowing units that can help um, integrate with online or team training, um, et cetera. Well, I, I, can, I can get that started and I think uh, some, some of the other panelists can chime in, but um, you know, to, to start with, and uh, full, full disclosure, uh, you, you won't, well, in any event, I have my Concept 2 shirt on, so uh, my, my bias is exposed, but uh, I think Concept 2 has an incredible online community and an incredible sort of infrastructure set up for collaborating with, with other rowers and scullers and people who are just into the erg and don't row or scull at all. Uh, worldwide. And if you go on their website, there are an enormous number of resources for that. I, I am not super familiar with um, the, the other manufacturers of ergs. I've, uh, I've been on a row perfect. It has a nice action. I've been on an Ortex slider. It has a nice action. Uh, I have not been on a hydro. I've heard good things about, about what hydro is doing. But uh, I, I really can't speak to, to that at all. Uh, I am very much a concept to partisan, but mostly because that's for 90, 99% of the erging that I have done over the course of 33 years of rowing has been on a, a fixed uh, 
a, a fixed concept two machine, um, meaning the, the one that sits and not, not the dynamic machine. Um, I kept Kevin, you have, uh, 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 yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree and actually have a similar uh, experience with with the majority of my time on a C2. Um, I, I have used the RP3 a ton. Um, the Ortec is really a great machine. Um, the Hydro, I have a, a, a good amount of experience. I think the resistance setting, which is uh, electronically um, set on the Hydro is really interesting and offers a huge range of um, options for adjusting the essentially the drag factor or the equivalent to the C2 drag factor. Yeah, I mean, there are a ton of options and the, you know, hydro, I think the closest corollary is that it sort of, uh, it fills a similar space to the Peloton um, is, is, I don't, I don't want to misrepresent their marketing position or their um, product, but I, I think that is the closest corollary to what that machine offers. From a rowing experience, it's it's great. Um, I agree with Troy, the C2 online community is enormous. Um, I'm not into the rowing ergometer community a ton, but the skier, I am very active on the online community and it's wonderful, um, great, great. Um, community of resources and support and camaraderie. Um, the RP3 from a performance functionality and a performance analysis perspective, it, it is a spectacular product and kind of a, in terms of its interface, a superior offering um, for the tablet display that the RP3 offers. So that long winded kind of uh, breakdown test drive them. Um, you know, if you can find a club, if you can find a school, if you can find a manufacturer, get on a, a machine because you'll, you'll see substantive differences between them all, substantive differences in what they each offer and finding the right niche for you is, is going to be personal. Awesome. Okay. And then Rick did actually just chime in and asked if any of you could mention the, or talk about the coffee machine, which has the two sculling handles. I don't know if is, is Rick able to talk about the coffee machine or I don't, I love the percolator, but um, no, I don't, I don't know much about the, I don't know much about the coffee machine. I'm out. I've used it. Rick, Rick, are you going to, are you going to, uh, are you going to do this? <laughs> I, I've seen the coffee machine. I've never actually been on one or, or taken, I, I, no, I, I take that back. I took a few strokes on it at the U.S. Rowing Convention in Philly last year and, uh, and, a, and a few strokes on it way back when, but uh, I have very little experience with the coffee machine. So, um, Sir, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, it does have two pivoting approximations of sculling handles, which from the machines that we've been talking about is a different, is a different movement pattern. Um, Laura put a, a link to their product in the chat and so you can learn more about it, but the, the handle dynamics are unique uh, on that coffee machine and it's a really interesting um, and I think effective approximation of the sculling motion. Troy, can you hear me? Yes. I would uh, second what Kevin says. Uh, I think it's an excellent, if you're gonna be on an ergometer, I would really highly recommend it. It's also on springs. It also has a port and starboard lean to it. Plus it, uh, as a dynamic erg, you bring the machine underneath you. So um, as ergs go, um, it's, it's bigger, it's bulkier, it's more expensive, but it's very well engineered and Calvin Coffee has tremendous uh, engineering capability. So I, in fact, I just, recently recommended that Bill Fordis from, um, from Salisbury, Connecticut just purchased one upon my recommendation. So I would really encourage you to ask people to look into it. Um, and I have no skin in the game here. I just think it's a great machine. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Rick. Um, Sarah, Lisa, anything to add? No. All right. Yeah. Erica, next. Sure. So 
uh, the, there were a couple questions coming in about interval training on the ERGs. So whether, um, if you could just address it generally, whether high intensity interval training, the HAIIT, um, could be beneficial to someone who's just erging for general fitness. Um, so anything on, the, on those topics? I could take that one. Um, I think in interval training is beneficial to everyone. Um, whether if you want to be a, just a fit person and you have access to a rowing machine and you have no intention of ever rowing on the water, you can, you'll still get a huge benefit from using an ergometer just because it's an all body workout. And interval training is a great part of every fitness program, whether you're doing that in a high intensity interval training class or in a spinning class or on the rowing machine or running. So I think you can't lose by doing interval training. I really like erging intervals because you get a little break and you can kind of renew your energy and attitude in between each piece. So that would be what I would say about interval training on the erg. Anyone else? I, I, as I find myself getting older and older, I do more and more intervals. Um, I want to, not, not just on the herb, but in weight training and circuit training and fitness training in general, um, just maintaining strength is critical as you age. Um, I think the cardio and long steady state utilization training is, is really important. Um, but I also, you know, uh, training plans with a good balance of both, I think, are are awfully effective. Okay, everyone satisfied with addressing intervals? Very satisfied. Thank you, Erica. Okay, I have nothing to add. Thank you all. Okay, Troy, I think this is a this is also a question from Rick, directed to you, and he told <laughs> me to ask you what the force curve looks like on the recovery. <laughs> Rick is an incorrigible agent of chaos <laughs> and he has slipped into his Dr. Parnassus role and I'm going to decline to answer that question entirely uh, and only make reference to, um, to keeping pressure on the back side of the blade, which is another of Rick's obsessions. Um, yeah, just stop, stop it, Rick, stop it. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, okay, so another question about force curves, which perhaps you will deign to address, um, which is this person was thinking that having a flat top on the force car curve is an issue. Um, but yeah, maybe you could address having a flat top to the force curve. Well, and first, first of all, when, when I alluded to a flat top, I wasn't alluding to a totally flat top. I was, uh, I was thinking of sort of just extending the curve a bit. Um, yeah, I, I, I doubt very seriously that a truly flat top curve, a truly flat top curve wouldn't be a curve. Um, and I'm, I'm going to uh, defer to Corzo's um, opinion that nobody knows what the optimal force curve looks like, uh, or at least that's his contention. Um, I, I don't think I know what the optimal force curve looks like, but uh, I, can, I can tell a very good one from a not very good one. So that's I, for, all I got. For, yeah, for those interested in in-depth technical analysis of a variety of force curves, Valerie Kleshnev's Biomechanics of Rowing is about as good a uh, um, uh, resources you can find if you if you really want to get into the weeds on different types of force curves even the orthodoxy of different nations how different countries row and skull um, that book is a great resource amongst amongst others not, not. I, I was wondering earlier today and uh, in, in as in, in deference to, to Rick, this is probably the kind of question that I would not have asked or, or the kind of assumption that I would not have made had I not um, spent so many years working and coaching with Rick. But um, I, I wondered, and I don't know the answer, um, but I assumed that an optimal force curve is probably different for every boat speed and every boat class. Um, you know, there, there, it, it may be, it may be a slightly different looking animal 
uh, from certainly I, I would expect it to be from from single to eight. Uh, so uh, you know that maybe maybe there's not there's there's probably not one optimal force curve. There is probably an optimal force curve for every situation, and every boat class and every boat speed. Um, so that's as uh, that's as cloudy as I'm willing to get in this public forum. Okay. Um, question about um, how to see and set the drag factor on a Concept2 monitor. Somebody besides me, please. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll try this one. Um, uh, the best answer is it's completely variable. That's my best answer. What I would say is you have a, on the, on the damper, right? So you have from all the way down to up to 10. Um, most people do not erg with it all the way up. And so the general, very extremely general, it depends what weight you are, how heavy you are, how fit you are, where you want your sit sitting. For example, um, I can use elite numbers and some master's numbers. Um, so for elite numbers, for lightweight women, 110 to 115. For open women, it was 115 to 120. Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong with that. That's correct. That's how Sarah I remember that. Yeah, okay. Do you remember it? Okay. For open weight men, sorry, lightweight men, 125 to 135. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. Open weight men from 135 up to 145. Correct? Somewhere in there? But each machine, each machine, you can't just go off the, you just can't go off the number on the, on the flywheel. Every machine can tell you the damper say. And every machine, if we were to line up 10 right now, 10 brand new machines, they may all read slightly different. So if you can check the damper setting, that will help you do that. Um, and as far as what you should set it to, what, what's the objective? What do you want to work for? What do you, you know, like you have to answer some of those questions. A very simple thing is, You've heard my numbers, go somewhere in the middle and then just test it out. Where it can be most efficient? Are you doing interval workouts or are you doing a long, um, uh, a long workout, you know, power workout? You decide what you want. Um, that's not really uh, informative. That's a very vague answer, but that's what I have to say about that. Sarah? Um, I, agree. I agree with you. I think um, the actual technicality of setting the drag factor, um, when you're looking at the monitor, um, I can't remember exactly what you have to push, but concept two at least, you can adjust the drag factor in addition to the damper setting with pushing numbers and adjusting drag to make it exactly 115 or 118 or whatever. Um, so I never mess with it. Um, I just put it on four and a half, five and do my thing. But if you really wanted to have it in an exact place, you'd have to work at it when you're designing your workout in the ERG, when you're saying setting workout, that's when you would also select whether you're looking at a 500 meter split or a thousand meter split and how much rest time, et cetera. That's where, that's the part of the process where you would set your drag factor. And, um, if it's not obvious to you, the good people at Concept2 could help you with it. And I don't know, I don't have enough familiarity with the other types of rowing machines to know where to begin with that, but I'm sure the manufacturer could help you with it. Awesome, yeah, and yeah, on the C2, if I remember correctly, it's just usually on the monitor, you can go to more options um, and see display drag factor. And then as soon as you start rowing, a number will show up on the monitor. And then you have to either have somebody help you or you can like reach forward and make small adjustments on the damper setting and then row again, see what the number is until you get it to what you want it to be. Um, okay, and then there was another question about damper setting as well. So this person asked, 
it, how you would explain to a non on the water rower, so I guess specifically an indoor rower, that having the damper lower will make their stroke more efficient. And then she said, if you'd even say that at all. All right, I'll start it. And then Kev, will you pick up? Okay. So if I put, so if you're a, just an indoor rower, right? You have never been on the water before. No big deal. No big deal. Um, you want to have a little bit of damper on there, but the resistance is going to come from your legs. You're going to create that power. You're going to create that, that split that you want. So if it were, say, up on, again, up on 10, 7, 8, 9, 10, um, that's going to be, to me, whenever I do that, or if I were to ever do that, that would be like picking up a really heavy dumbbell. Or, sorry, um, um, like just trying to do a really heavy clean. Now, if I were to go a little bit lighter with my clean, which would be about a three or a five, then I could actually do a really dynamic movement and I could feel all my muscles engage at the same time when they're supposed to engage, as opposed to a strain. I'm not looking to strain on the erg. I feel it like tension. I'm looking for an explosive movement. And so that's how I would adjust for a non-rower, adjust my erg. Say between, between three and five is a really safe place. But Kev, I'm gonna give this one back over to you. I think it's individual. Um, my like sweet spot for steady state erging is 155 drag, which is beautiful for me. It's heavy for other people. Um, there are guys on, you know, they're heavyweight men's rowers who standardize their steady state at 165. Um, there are others who do it at 125. I think it, it is worth trial and error experimentation. As Sarah and Erica both explained, you can display the drag factor when you're in the settings menu screen and experiment with what you really like. Lisa's uh, exercise that she shared in those videos, um, as you lower the drag factor and go to extremely low settings, it becomes very difficult and tricky, but worthwhile to try and row with efficiency um, and to execute the, the motions the best you can. There's a very well-known coach who um, I have great regard and respect for, Zeno Mueller, who advocates training plans with extremely high drag factors, 200 and above. Um, so I think there's a, a wide range in the efficacy, a wide range of drag factors that can be used with efficacy. Try it out, see what feels best for you is my best deferral of that question. Great. Um, another question kind of related to the mechanics of the concept too, or um, curious if any of you can address this. This person was saying that they've been working on getting comfortable with higher stroke rates for shorter pieces. And were, was wondering if any of you could explain how the C2 or calculates the end of one stroke and the beginning of the next, um, like what triggers um, the change over from the stroke rate from one stroke to the next. How, like, so how is cadence calculated? Or, I mean, strokes, yeah, strokes per minute is a, um, it's a measure of frequency, right? I mean, I, I don't know when, I mean, it, it's just a, yeah, a, a measure of your, of your, the, the frequency of an entire stroke cycle. So, I don't know, Troy, can you ask Dick or Pete the next time you see him? Uh, yeah, I, I think that's that's what we would have to do because um, I, I think that what's what's being asked is is sort of a more complicated question than the one that you're answering, and it's uh, it's one that I don't know the answer to. Um, but you know, just in in very in very simple layman's terms, the the monitor is is just measuring how how fast the wheel is spinning and how many revolutions. Uh, and I, I don't know what unit it it is granulated to, whether it's measuring it every hundredth of a second, every tenth of a second, what what have you. Um, 
And so I, I, I cannot provide an engineer's answer to that question. Uh, and so we're going to have to, we're going to have to defer to Dick and Pete. And I will, I will ask next time I see one of them, but, um, very briefly, I, I want to take the opportunity because this reminded me of, um, of a conversation that I had with, with Dick Dreisigacker about the ERG in the parking lot at Craftsbury. And, you know, if you, if you look at people's 2K ERG times, um, a lot of people think that the Concept2 machine was originally calibrated to represent what your time would be if you were rowing with three more of yourself in a straight four. Um, you know, you look at your 2K time, well, everybody's 2K time is a lot faster than they can row 2K in a single. And everybody's uh, 2K time is a lot slower than they would row in an eight with seven other people of, of their strength and fitness and ability. And so a lot of people think it was calibrated to the straight four. And I asked Dick, you know, how, how did you calibrate it? And it was, was, it, was it sort of pegged to the straight four? And the story that he told me, and I, I sometimes think that this was a hallucination and the conversation never took place, but I'm pretty sure it took place. He said, um, no, it was, it was nothing like that. Back on the Model A machine with the, with the bicycle speedometer for a monitor instead of a, a digital performance monitor, um, it took a fit collegiate varsity rower about a minute and a half to row a mile on that bicycle speedometer. And when they switched over to the Model B machine and created a digital monitor, they took the number of revolutions that it took to, to go a mile on the bicycle speedometer and said, okay, that's 500 meters because minute 30, heavyweight male oarsman, that's about, that's about right for 500 meters. And so the, the scientific calibration of the Concept2 machine was based on the number of revolutions on a bicycle, uh, on a bicycle speedometer uh, produced an output of what the bicycle speedometer said was a mile. And so it's, it's not calibrated to the straight four. It just is what it is. Cool. Um, that actually dovetails nicely with a question that I got, which I'll address in just a second. But um, Rick did message me and he said that the, the stroke rate is calculated by the time from between accelerations of the wheel, um, if that helps to address the original question. Okay, so I got a question, which I think you basically did just address, Troy, but um, the question was, is there a relation between the 500 meter split time on an earth on the water? Yes, it roughly corresponds to what four clones of yourself would produce in a straight four, but that's not how they came to it. <laughs> um, okay, and another question about concept two and the use of them. Um, Wondering if you guys could address the use of the slides with the Concept2 static erg. I think that's all you, Kevin. Uh, sorry. Um, it was one of the first kind of uh, uh, adaptations to make the static stationary erg dynamic. So placing the erg on the two sliding brackets that sit on the metal platforms of a slide turned a once static erg into a dynamic one. So um, yeah, we use, I, I have used the slides for a long time. Um, they are a, a much cheaper way to get access to a dynamic ergometer. Um, they take up a pretty large footprint, a little bit bigger than the Ortec footprint, ultimately, but um, they're a, a very simple way to, again, turn a static erg into a dynamic erg and can be linked so that you can have multiple ergs connected to one another, um, which most of the machines, whether it's a RP3 or the bio rower or um, the Ortec or the C2 dynamic, can all be connected via some mechanism, whether it's the C2 bar or the um, RP3 yokes. You know, you can you can connect all the machines um, to one another as you can with those older style C2 slides. I actually uh, wanted to revisit the the previous question, or maybe it was two questions ago, about what erg times correspond to in terms of on water times. Um, I, I 
felt like my my initial response was a little more flippant than I wanted it to be, and so I want to give a, a slightly more serious answer. And the the, the simple answer is that uh, erg times, by and large, don't have a clear relationship with times on the water. And what what I mean by that is that I've I've, I've seen um, well just actually to take a to take a classic example i i think that um elite women's doubles in particular i've i've looked at a lot of their results at world cup and world championship races and compared that to elite men's doubles at world championship and world cup races and i i have i have a pretty good sense from the data that uh elite women's doubles get more boat speed out of the same erg times that, and, and they're, they're, they, they row more efficiently. So the, the, the bottom line is don't assume that because you have a faster erg time than someone else, that that means you're going to move a boat faster than someone else. I've, I've seen it happen where somebody of the same basic stature who was a, 614 2k lost to somebody who had a 632 2k in the single and it you know it, it came down to to other factors than pure horsepower um so the 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 correspondence is a rough one i i think you can you can valuably use the ergometer and your data from the ergometer to give you a sense of i am getting fitter i am getting stronger and if your erg time improves you can probably expect to see better times on the water, but you can't meaningfully compare yourself to someone else and say, oh, well, my erg time is better than this person's erg time. Therefore, I should be beating this person on the water. There, there is no should about it. Um, so er, erg data is great for, for tracking your own progress. It's, it's a little flawed for comparing athletes to one another. All right. Okay, so there are a couple of questions that came in about using the ERG for addressing like some specific technical points. So kind of, I'm not going to get into the specifics, but basically asking about like maybe untraditional ERG or non-traditional ERG drills. Um, and someone was specifically asking, I thought this was an interesting one, if you would recommend incorporating the tap down um, at the release and the lift of the hands to drop the blades in that you would in a boat while you were erging. Um, panelists, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm going to say no. Yeah, I uh, agree. <laughs> thank you. I, I'm just, I'm just going to say no on that one. Um, I don't think we need to do that because as the body is fluid, arms extend out, your elbow is coming out, your hands are already a little bit lower, and as you, as you come to full compression, your hands raise up naturally, and it's all natural, that's kind of where I'm talking about, and catching underneath your armpit and just draw straight through. So to, to um, especially if you're in a sculling boat, the tap down is so minor, and also um, at the release is so minor. And then also when you're at the catch uh, of a sculling boat, you're thinking more, sorry, I think more outside the boat as opposed to a lift. So if my hands go outside the gunnels, my blades are going to let go of the oar handles, my blades are going to drop in. So I try, I try not to artificially make that movement, which could be two to three inches of movement, um, our body naturally does it. And so if we can just, if, if you can get away from thinking about artificially making it happen and just go with literally your body mechanics, it will happen. And then also with the machine. And once you transition over to the boat, the boat and the oar settings and the height will make it happen as well. I don't think you need to practice that. That's just my two cents. I would, I would also, I would second that and add to it to say that one of the things that is hardest to do for people who are moving from sweep rowing into sculling 
is to unlearn that idea that you have to lift the hands at the catch and tap the hands down at the finish. It, it just makes you slower in a single. So definitely, I would not recommend practicing that on the erg, practicing a lift and a tap down on the erg. Okay, awesome. Um, any other, anyone else have any comments just about like drills on the erg or using the erg to make technical changes? Any creative ways they've done that? I really like doing feet out on the erg. Mm -hmm. I think it actually couples nicely with, with the drill that Lisa was talking about, putting the towel over the fan. Um, just in terms of training your body to get all of your work done while it still makes sense to be doing that work. If you, if you find that you row feet out and you can't get a good split, that, mean, that might mean that you're depending a little too much on what's happening in the back half of your stroke. And it's not actually gonna be making the boat go faster. So I would, in addition to practicing lessening your drag, I would also practice erging with your feet out and trying to get the same, generate the same amount of power with your feet out. Awesome. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, okay. Uh, there's a question from somebody asking um, how much is too much on the ERG, which I guess is probably a pretty individual question. So I'm, I'm thinking about rephrasing it to how do you know how much is too much for you personally? Uh, can you narrow that down? What do you mean? How much is too much? Like, um, in terms of like meters or mileage. I'm going to reverse back re um, what Kevin said. Everything is individualized. I mean, you've got to go I mean, talk to your coach, talk to a mentor, talk to a teammate, um, write down in your books. But like what Kevin has said so many times is like, it's completely personalized, you know? So you got to figure out what's too much. Um, and of course, um, depending on what age you are, what category you fall into, how hard you want to go, how fast you want to go, what, you know, are you trying to make an elite team? Or are you trying to do masters? Are you trying to get just generally fit? Just monitor that. And like, if you have a question, if you're thinking, do, if you're thinking you're doing too little, talk to someone and then tell them the reason why you think you're maybe doing too little. If you think you're doing too much, talk to someone and say, these are the types of workouts I'm doing, and this is the reason why, but I don't think I'm getting faster. How can I get faster? It's talk to a coach, email a coach, but all those things are really personal. Like you can, there's no blanket statement out there that I know of, unless, panelists? I, I agree with that 100%. Um, I, I, I do think that, you know, if, if you're, if you're improving and you're not getting injured or getting sick, you're probably not doing too much. However, um, Lisa's advice is, is very good advice. Uh, you know, if you want to optimize, it's, it's very hard to coach yourself and it's very hard to know what, uh, what you should be doing in terms of an optimal training plan. Um, so talk to a coach. We've got a lot of them. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so there's a question from a fellow Craftsbury coach who was talking about, um, or she asked about how both Kevin and Sarah addressed um, having like a certain, a positive attitude or a, a mental toughness mantra is basically just mental approaches to erging. And she was wondering how you would apply that, um, basically the loving the erg and conquering the erg, how you would apply those ideas to the water. I, I have the same mantras, you know, and, and kind of, and they're not, they're not koans, but you know, the same like, mental approaches and you know it's positive self-talk it's positive visualization it is finding like the strategies that help you endure through the really challenging periods of your training or your racing um which you know for carrying lessons from athletics into our general lives i think i 
I have some of those same koans, whether it's in my personal life or professional life as well. But um, I, for me, they don't differ very much. Um, you know, a, a grueling like AT workout on the ERG is very similar in my mental approach to a grueling AT workout on the water or a 80 minute skill and drill steady state session on the water. Very similar to how I approach it on the ERG. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't have. A, I, I think they complement each other for me very, very well. Okay. Um, Sarah, did you want to address that one as well? Yes. Yes. Um, I think my strategies for that have changed and evolved over time. When I was competing um, on the elite level. It was much more just like lots of positive self-talk. You could do this, you've got this, like just stay positive, keep a winning attitude. Now in my 40s, every time I take my single out, I feel like I am just giving myself a gift. It is such a privilege and it is such a beautiful thing to be able to do. I just feel grateful. And I think even if I'm having a horrible row, I there's this it might sound a little corny, but one of the years I was there coaching at Craftsbury and I was participating in the 5k trail run and I was not in very good shape. I hadn't, hadn't been staying fit very well that particular summer. And I was really having a horrible 5k run. I mean, awful. And there was an older woman who, um, I think, um, I can't remember her name, but she runs it every week and she's really fast. And she was walking down the hill. She'd been finished for a long time. And she saw me coming up the last hill. And she said to me very quietly, you're bettering yourself. And it really sat with me. So even if I'm having an awful row, I'm doing something for myself that is improving my life, even if it's in a tiny little way. And that actually makes a really big difference for me, staying positive and having a good attitude about sculling, even when I'm doing hard pieces. So, yeah. Awesome. Um, um, er, sorry, Erica, I'll, I'll just add one thing from a sculling session that I had a couple days ago. Um, it was really bad water, really not a great, you know, it's a challenging day on the water. And I, I just tried to remind myself to build off of small successes. So taking a couple of good strokes in a row or even having a really clean release or, um, and I think connecting it to the erg, you know, a small success is a success nonetheless. So you can then build off of that and ride that momentum to another success and a, and a larger one um, down the line. Um, I think those are both lovely notes that would be nice to end on, but I do kind of, it, it is, it is, we're a little past time. We're getting past 530. So I think I'll kind of ask this one more question that sort of lumps a couple together. There were several people asking about heart rate training on the ERG. Um, one person was kind of asking whether uh, it makes sense to sort of stay in a target zone, heart rate zone and not exceed it as a master's scholar. And someone else was just sort of asking for general tips. They felt like starting to use heart rate in their ERG training improved the quality and wondering if you had any further thoughts on that. I'll, I'll start that one off because I do a lot of training with a heart rate monitor. And when I was younger, I did exactly no training with a heart rate monitor. And the first place my mind goes is to, um, to sort of a, an old training adage that I, that I fall back on all the time, which is that most people's easy workouts are too hard and most people's hard workouts are not hard enough. And very brief story, when I was coaching the Duluth Rowing Club back in the early 90s, this was the, the early days of affordable heart rate monitors that individuals could buy for themselves. And one of the older scholars in the club told me, yeah, you know, so-and-so got a heart rate monitor. And everybody I know who's gotten a heart rate monitor has gotten slower. And, you know, I, I thought that was a, an awfully um, peremptory blanket statement on his part, but I, I knew what he was talking about. And, you know, frankly, when, when I, I don't want to see the numbers if I'm rowing hard. If I'm doing a hard set of intervals, I don't care what my heart rate is. I'm, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to make the bow ball get to the finish line as fast as I can. And I don't want to be thinking about, oh, gosh, is my heart rate a little higher than it should be at this point in the piece? I don't want to see the numbers. If I, if I could have a coach in a launch who could see my heart rate numbers and, and sort of uh, graph that data for me later, that would be awesome. 
having said that, um, to keep my easy workouts from being too hard and to pr provide myself with a challenge, I, I do an awful lot of miles where I'm tr I give myself a heart rate cap and I try to see how fast I can move the boat without exceeding my heart rate cap. And that sort of keeps me from, from getting over exuberant and the, the 18 year old in me just wanting to go. And I, you know, I know I need a steady state day. I know I need a recovery day. I, I don't need to be out there doing battle paddle. Uh, and usually I'm sculling by myself. So I'm, I'm battle paddling with, with invisible opponents, but um, it still, it still happens. So uh, I, I think I think heart rate training can be very useful for for keeping your easy workouts from being too hard, for uh, increasing your efficiency. I for those those of you who have been to Craftsbury as campers, um, I have head of the Hosmer records for every ten heart rates. I've got a under a hundred heart rate head of the Hosmer record: one ten, one twenty, one thirty, one forty, one fifty. Uh, my max is about one eighty now. So um, my yeah. My, my, my real head of the Hosmer record is my 180 heart rate head of the Hosmer record. Anybody else? I just encourage people to have accurate numbers. So I worked with two clients who had been given heart uh, programs based off of heart rate data that was not an accurate reflection of their current fitness. 220 minus your age is not a reliable maximum heart rate number. Um, do an aerobic threshold test do an anaerobic threshold test, do a VO2 max test if you're able, and get reliable heart rate data for your current fitness because it is a, it covers a huge range. So these programs that just kind of give a general kind of range, they're fine, but they can be really inaccurate and you can waste a lot of time working at an incorrect heart rate. So um, there are great books and resources about how to run a lactate threshold test or a aerobic threshold test so that you can get really good data that you can then work your percentages off of and do some really efficient training with, with heart rate. Awesome. Okay, any final thoughts from anybody? I'm, I'm I, wanna, I want to thank Rick for enlightening this discussion so much and making Troy peeved. That was really a highlight <laughs> for me. <laughs> that's, that's Rick's stock and trade, man. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rewatch Sarah's last response because I thought that was just great. It brought tears to my eyes um, in, in, in 100 percent seriously. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, like, like Erica, I, I wish that we had been fresh out of questions at that point. but. Um, Thank everyone for coming, um, or thank you everyone for coming, and uh, maybe we'll see you next week for Erica's webinar, uh, Triremes and Trojans and Rowing in the Ancient World. Um, until next Wednesday, uh, Erica, you got the outro music queued up? I do. Let's, he let's hear it. All right. Thanks, Erica. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. This is awesome. Um, feels like being back in, in, at camp with everybody. Okay, let me know if you can hear it. Okay, so this is a piece of music that was shared with us by some people who've been listening to our webinars. Marisol and Chris Gorn, who composed it and recorded it, told us that we could use it as our outro music after they heard Troy joking about needing outro music after week. So we hope you enjoy it as we do that. All right, so I'm, I'm going to watch the participants list, and we'll, we'll probably let this play to the end. It's about a three a three minute and thirty second experience. Um, I might end the meeting when we get down to about ten participants, or we might just end the meeting when the when the music ends.